It's Australia Day, January 26th, 1966, a scorching hot summer's day tailor-made for drinking, swimming and all-round revelry to celebrate Aussie culture. But for a couple of parents living in Somerton Park, Adelaide, the day would bring something far more sinister. Because on that day, their three children, Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont, vanished without a trace and they would never be seen or heard from again. Hi folks, I'm Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. The question that's been haunting people for 57 years now is what the hell happened to the Beaumont children? These are the kind of mysteries that keep you up at night, that make you want to keep reading even when you know you shouldn't. And despite a jaw-dropping $1 million reward, a handful of suspects who could make your skin crawl, and one of the most massive searches in Australian history, this case is still as cold as the day those poor kids disappeared. So let me take you back to a typical suburban household in 1966. You've got a couple of parents, so let's call them Jim and Nancy Beaumont, who are just trying to raise their three children in Adelaide, Australia. There's Jane, who's nine years old and a bit of a bookworm, Anna, who's seven and loves nothing more than playing dress up, and little Grant, who's just five, still learning to ride his bike without training wheels. It's the kind of family setup that you could find in any neighborhood in any part of the world. But what happened to them was anything but typical. So Jim Beaumont was a taxi driver. He was working hard to support his family, while Nancy took care of the kids at their cosy little cottage on 109 Harding Street, Somerton Park. It's the kind of place where you would wave to your neighbours as you headed out the door. The kind of place where everyone knew everyone else's business. It was only a five minute drive away from the popular Glenelg Beach, where Jim dropped off his kids on January 25th, 1966. He figured that Jane, the eldest of the siblings, was responsible enough to watch over her little brother and sister while they played in the sand. The kids made it back home safe and sound that day. They'd proved that they were responsible enough to look after themselves. But then came January 26th, the next day. A day that would go down in history for the family. The sun was scorching hot and the kids couldn't resist the call of the beach again. They left at 8.45 in the morning, promising to be back at noon. Their mother, Nancy, waited patiently for the bus to arrive. But when the 12pm bus pulled up without their children, she began to worry. She figured, okay, they must have missed their ride and would be home on the 2pm bus. But when that one came in and went with no sign of the kids, panic began to set in. As soon as Jim got wind that his kids were missing, he cut short his business trip and rushed home. When the clock struck 3pm and there was still no sign of Jane, Anna and Grant, Jim and Nancy hit the road in search of their little ones. They scoured the beach and the surrounding area, asking anyone and everyone if they had seen their children. But it was like they had just vanished into thin air. Next, the frantic parents hit up all the neighbours and friends that they could think of, hoping that the kids had just gotten sidetracked on their way home. But no, that wasn't the case. Finally, at 5.30pm, they headed to the Glen Elg police station to report their children missing, and so began the most infamous cold case in all of Australia. What sort of a girl uh, is, is Jane, the nine-year-old? Is she... Uh... Oh, very intelligent, very intelligent. Um, you've only got to tell her a thing once, and uh, uh, she always does what she's told, never to talk to any strangers on the beach. When she swims there, always in groups. Be quite able to look after the other two. Oh, quite capable, quite capable. The news of the Beaumont children's disappearance spread like wildfire, and within a day, it seemed like everyone in the country knew about this. Airports, railways, and even highways were put on high alert as authorities suspected that the kids might have been abducted. Meanwhile, the local police held out hope that the children had just wandered off and began scouring the beach again and the surrounding area for any sign of them. They searched every nook and cranny, from buildings to the streets, hoping against hope that the kids would turn up safe and sound. But the more they looked, the more hopeless this all seemed. So the first thing, over here towards this ridge. Right, you can break line now and come over. But none of this would yield any results. The kids had gone on the beach with a whole bunch of stuff. Clothes, towels, bags, you name it. 
But when they vanished, none of these things could be found anywhere. It was like they just disappeared into thin air. After three agonising days with no news about their whereabouts, the cops decided to throw out a $250 reward to anyone who had any information. I mean, back then, that was quite a lot of cash. It was like over three grand in today's money. Though some people, though, even back then, thought that the reward was too measly. It did manage to get some witnesses to come forward and finally give the investigators some leads. Now, here's where things start to get a bit interesting. There was a bakery nearby called Wenzel's and apparently Jane had stopped by to grab some pasties and a meat pie at around 12.20pm. She paid with a £1 note, which might not sound like a big deal, but it actually raised some serious red flags for the investigators. You see, the thing is, the Beaumont children never bought meat pies in the past, and they certainly didn't like the taste of them. Plus, they had only been given six shillings and sixpence for lunch and a return bus trip, so someone gave them that £1 note. As the investigation progressed, more and more witnesses came forward with stories of seeing the kids walking around with a tall, tanned man in about his mid-thirties. This guy had brown hair, was thin, and was wearing swimming trunks. Witnesses mentioned that the kids seemed to be having some fun with him, playing around and feeling at ease in his presence. The parents of the kids mentioned that their children were extremely shy, so playing confidently with a complete stranger would seem rather out of character. That's why investigators theorised that maybe the children knew the man or had met him on a previous trip to the beach, which is definitely possible since they were just there the day before. Anna's comment days before the disappearance added more weight to this theory. She had casually mentioned to her mother that Jane had gotten a boyfriend down the beach, but Nancy had paid little attention to it. Well, until now. So here's the thing. After playing in the park with some dude, the kids apparently hung around, waiting for him to change his clothes. Witnesses say that they saw the trio walking away from the beach with this mystery man at around quarter past twelve, right around the same time the kids were supposed to be catching their bus home. Meanwhile, there was another sighting from some lady who claimed that she spoke to three children who looked a lot like the Beaumont kids at around 7pm that night. The police went all out on this one, even draining the boat haven trying to find any signs of these missing children. But despite the extensive search, nothing concrete ever emerged. The sighting of three kids resembling the Beaumont children was deemed a dead end. The cops' focus had narrowed down to this mysterious man seen with the kids on that fateful day. All clues pointed towards him. The police department released sketches of the man to the public, hoping that someone would recognise him. With the parents living in agony and the whole country in shock, Everyone was asking the same question. Who was this guy? Let's take a wee detour and delve into another case that is related to the disappearance of the Beaumont children. The case of Joanna Ratcliffe and Kirsty Gordon. This happened a few years after the Beaumont children vanished. This was in 1973. Joanne, aged 11, and Kirsty, aged 4, disappeared from the Adelaide Oval. The details of this case sound like a carbon copy of the Beaumont children's disappearance. The parents left their kids alone to go to the restroom. The kids never returned. And in the following hour and a half, there were a bunch of reports stating that they were seen with a strange man. Witnesses claimed that the girls looked scared whilst walking alongside this unidentified man who bore an uncanny resemblance to the man that was spotted on Glenelg Beach back in 66. The police sketches for the Joanne Ratcliffe and Kirsty Gordon case looked eerily similar to the sketches from the Beaumont children's case. There were other striking similarities too, like the location of the abduction, the age of the children, and the circumstances surrounding their disappearance. As a result, investigators have often speculated that the same person may have been responsible for both of these abductions. This information will be crucial when examining the four potential suspects. The first suspect in this case was a guy called Derek Ernest Percy, who was brought up as a possible kidnapper in an article published by The Age news website in 2007. Percy had been one of the longest serving criminals in Victoria since his first serious crime in 1969. Back then, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, 
with his psychological condition preventing him from remembering the details of his actions. Percy had mentioned that he was at Glenelg Beach with his family on the same day as the Bowman children's disappearance and had a hunch that he actually might have abducted them since he was in the area at that time. However, as I said, due to his psychological condition, he had absolutely no recollection of doing so. So this guy, Percy, was a potential suspect in the disappearance of the Beaumont children. But there were some pretty big issues with him being a culprit. Firstly, he was only 17 years old at the time, which is significantly younger than the mid-30s age range reported by many of the witnesses. Plus, there were some questions about whether he even had a car back then, which would have been crucial for escaping undetected with the kids. And finally, he was locked up in jail from 1969 for his first major crime, which would have made it impossible for him to be involved in the 1973 Adelaide Oval disappearance. And since the investigators believe firmly that both cases were committed by the same person, it's looking pretty unlikely that Percy was responsible for the Beaumont children's disappearance. Now, let's talk about the second suspect, Harry Phipps. He caught the attention of investigators in 2013 after a book called The Saturn Man, uncovering the mystery of the missing Beaumont children, was published. Phipps was a well-to-do factory owner and a member of Adelaide's social elite. He had a habit of giving out one-pound notes and bore a resemblance to the police sketch. Later, it was discovered that he had a sexual interest in young children. In 2007, Phipps' son, Hayden, who was 15 years old back in 1966, well, he came forward to the police and revealed that he had actually seen the missing children in his father's yard on the day of their disappearance. Season four, how long were you standing talking to Harry? Oh, only long enough until he took them inside, or he took them inside. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I came out of the cubby house and went inside to see if it was uh, going on. And the front door was open, so I just assumed I left out the front door. I mean, this is certainly a possibility, given the fact that Phipps lived just 300 metres from Glenelg Beach. I also mentioned earlier that the children appeared to be at ease with this man, suggesting that they may have met him before. If this is true, then it's more likely that the kidnapper was local. This could also explain why the children went into the bakery by themselves. See, Phipps may have suspected that the staff would recognise his face from any previous visits, so he sent the kids in alone. In 2013, two individuals who worked at Phipps Factory said that as teenagers back in 1966, they had been paid to dig a deep two square metre hole in his factory yard for an undisclosed reason. Let's fast forward now to 2013. Police had an excavation in the factory of Harry Phipps hoping to find information related to this case. Unfortunately, the search turned up nothing significant. And in 2018, investigators decided to go back to the same site and dig even further this time, hoping to find some valuable evidence. Sadly, all they found was a pile of garbage and some animal bones. However, there was another interesting development. On the day of the children's disappearance, Jane was carrying a very distinctive white clipped money purse. After Harry Phipps had passed away in 2004, Stuart Mullins visited his widow Elizabeth at their house. As Mullins was rummaging through Harry Phipps' basement, he stumbled upon a pristine white clipped purse sitting on a shelf all by its lonesome. Knowing that Jane Beaumont had a similar purse on the day of the disappearance, Mullins inquired about it to Phipps' widowed wife, who frantically denied any connection. But Mullins was not convinced and he pressed further, asking, well, okay, how did the purse end up in the basement? With a sharp tone, Phipps' wife told Mullins to hit the road. A few days later, the police came knocking, hoping to get their hands on this mysterious purse, but it had already been tossed out by Phipps' widow. While it's possible that she threw it out to avoid unwanted attention, it still raised eyebrows and fueled even more suspicion surrounding Harry Phipps' potential involvement in this case. Now we come to Arthur Stanley Brown, a man from Queensland who was charged with the abduction of two young girls back in 1998. The actual abduction happened in 1970, and but this was about four years after the Beaumont children disappeared and three years before the Adelaide Oval disappearance in 1973. 
It's an intriguing timeline, and the nature of his 1970 abduction charge certainly makes him a strong suspect. But what really stands out is just how much he looks like the police sketches for both the Beaumont and the Adelaide Oval cases. If you ask me, it's uncanny. So in 1998, when Arthur Stanley Brown's face first appeared on TV for abducting two young girls in Queensland, one witness from the Adelaide Oval case immediately recognised him as the man involved in this abduction 25 years ago. Witnesses from the Adelaide Oval case had previously described the abductor as wearing a wide-brimmed hat with a low, flat crown, which was uncommon in Adelaide, but it was typical in the hot northern regions of Australia, where Brown had lived. This detail certainly made Brown a compelling suspect. One of Arthur Stanley Brown's acquaintances had a memory that pointed the finger in his direction. Apparently, Brown had mentioned seeing Adelaide's Festival Theatre when it was still under construction, which placed him in Adelaide around June of 1973. This was just two months before the Adelaide Oval abductions in August of that same year. There seems to be a lot of evidence implicating Brown in the Adelaide Oval abductions, but not so much linking him to the Beaumont disappearance, aside from the resemblance between the police sketches. When Brown was arrested in 1998, he was 86 years old. He was suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. He was deemed unfit to stand trial and died in 2002 at the age of 90, never once mentioning anything about the Adelaide Oval or the Beaumont disappearances. So, there's this guy named Bevan Spencer von Einem, who was convicted of doing something similar to a 15 year old boy in 1984. But what's really interesting is that he admitted to being the mystery man on the beach. Apparently, an informant known as Mr. B told the police that Von Einem had bragged about taking these three children from a beach years earlier. Von Einem claimed that he performed brilliant surgery on these three children, but one of the children passed away in the process. He then dumped the other two in bushland south of Adelaide. He also confessed to taking two girls from an Adelaide football match but wouldn't give any more details on that. Now, Von Einem does kind of match the police sketch, but he was only 19 back in 1966, which again is a lot younger than the mid-30s age range reported by all the witnesses. Of course it's possible that Von Einem was simply lying about his involvement in these cases, maybe to gain attention and notoriety. It's also worth noting that he's one of the few remaining suspects who are actually still alive so there is a possibility of further explanation or evidence coming to the light in future. Regardless, it's clear that the crimes committed against the Beaumont children and others have had a lasting impact on their families and the wider community. The search for answers and closure continues. Two years after the Beaumont children vanished in 1968, their parents received two letters that claimed to be from their eldest daughter Jane. The letter stated that the children were living in a relatively pleasant life with the man who had taken them. According to the letters, the man had appointed himself as the children's guardian and was willing to return them to their parents. The letter even included a meeting location. The Beaumont parents, along with a detective, went to the meeting place, but no one ever showed up. Another letter was then sent out to the Beaumonts stating that the man had decided not to return the children after noticing that there was a detective present at the prior meeting place. Unfortunately, no further letters were ever received. So 24 years after the Beaumont children went missing, some letters claiming to be from Jane were discovered. Turns out a 17-year-old guy wrote them as part of a prank, and because so much time had passed, he never got charged for it. But the case had gained worldwide attention, so they even brought in a psychic named Jarrett Crosset to try and help. But his search for the children was a bust, and his hunches were changing all the time. At one point, he thought the kids were buried under a warehouse near their school. The warehouse owners didn't want to dig it up, just purely because a psychic's feeling. But eventually, $40,000 was raised to demolish the building. But, surprise, surprise, no evidence of the Beaumont case was ever found at the dig. After the kids vanished, Jim and Nancy Beaumont decided to stay put in the Somerton Park home. They said it would have been terrible if the kids had returned home and found no one there. In the 1980s, they went their separate ways and eventually called it quits for good. They also sold the infamous Somerton Park home where they had endured so much sorrow. Sadly, Nancy passed away in a nursing home in Adelaide on September 16th, 2019 at the age of 92, without ever knowing 
what had become of her children. Jim, now in his 90s, well, he still lives in Adelaide, holding on to hope that the case will be solved before he leaves this earth. It's heart-wrenching to think that he has spent most of his life without any answers about what happened to three of his children. In January of 2019, the South Australian Premier Jay Wetherill made a statement that the police had never given up on this case. It's reassuring to hear that the case remains open and active. The Government of South Australia continues to offer a reward of $1 million for any information that could shed a light on the mystery of the Beaumont children's disappearance. So, what's your thoughts on this case? Do any of the suspects grab your attention? Or do you think something else happened? Listen, take care of yourselves out there, folks, okay? Tell someone you love them. Stay safe. And always remember, keep smiling.